Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 19 of Small Room. I'm here with John Luca Avanzato. Um, first question I always ask everyone, uh, what are you famous for? All right. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, I've been wanting to be on this podcast for a while. I've uh, been uh, watching a couple of videos here and there. Just saw the one where you went to the, the Trump rally uh, in FIU. Props to that, man. You got some balls to go up uh, and ask these people these questions. And I like, uh, like what you're doing with the podcast and the channel. Um, so what am I famous for? Um, well, I wouldn't say I'm famous for anything, but I'm known to doing something uh, back in school, um, selling sandwiches at school. And uh, I don't know who's watching, but if you went to, to Coral Gable Senior High, you might've seen me with a, a red bag in the hallway, always asking people, do um, you want a sandwich? Do you want a sandwich? And I might even ask you if you wanted one. So um, yeah, that's, I guess people uh, saw me a lot and, uh, and then we ended up calling me the, the sandwich boy or the sandwich man. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I got a little reputation there behind doing that. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, that, I guess that's where I'll title the video, Sandwich Boy. <laughs> no, Sandwich Man, Sandwich Man. All right, Come on. Sandwich Man. I'll give you the Sandwich Man. But <laughs> uh, what gave you the idea to start selling sandwiches in school? Um, it was back in the, in, uh, I think it was beginning at yeah, beginning of junior year. Uh, my dad used to make me some, uh, panini sandwiches for school. And, um, one day one of my friends asked me, Oh, can I, uh, have a bite of that? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Gave him a bite. And he's like, I'll give you uh, a dollar for another bite. Okay, yeah, sure. And he gave me a dollar, fair enough, and uh, took a bite of my sandwich. And as well, like, I've, you know, I've been going to the same public school system in Miami, and I've seen, like, the, caf the cafeteria food, but it's always been the same. You know, you have your uh, mac and glue where you flip the tray upside down, and it'll still stick up there. You know, you have uh, the, 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 the mini burgers and these plastic bags and shit. And, like, most of the people don't really eat that much at school. Like the, for example, the cafeteria food because it's really shit food. So people go like the whole day without eating anything. And I saw that as an opportunity to um, one, help people, you know, f feed, like feed them, you know, you need that energy throughout the day. You know what I mean? Like you can't go out the whole day without eating anything. So saw that as an opportunity and uh, yeah, and then I could also make a little bit of money at the same time. And, but yeah, I just wanted to help people as well. And some, something to keep me busy and keep me on my toes a little bit as well. So, yeah. All right. So you would say that your success in sandwich making in terms of the popularity of your sandwiches came from how, you know, the, the school food wasn't that good. And that gave you a day and night difference between your product and the school product you know, your sandwiches were like organic, you know? Yeah, I mean, okay, organic, I don't know about organic, but I could say that I made my own pesto sauce, uh, homemade, I grew it on my balcony, literally had like a, a plantation of basil on my balcony. And uh, yeah, so that's, you know, a cost of buying ba uh, pesto already made and, you know, learn how to make some pesto. So I'm um, also known for making some good pesto from my family. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, part of what I think, you know, other than just the school food being not that good, um, which led to your success and long-term viability. And this is just me gathering was that, you know, everyone who sold like food slash snacks in school, like yeah. no offense to them, you know, everyone else was just like really lazy for the most part. And what I yeah, mean, and that, they did it. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, they did it for like a short amount of time. So, you know, you'd see the, the cheerleaders selling brownies for a couple of days, you know, you have everyone doing like, oh, selling candy here, you know, chocolate bars from the school, actually. Um, and, you know, there was no one really consistent, consistently coming every single day of the week with food ready at hand, you know what I mean? So like I, I had to set myself apart one, you know, I had to like work on 
talking to people, you know, selling a product then and there, you know, right in front of them. Um, and, and yeah, so I took it as well as like a learning experience as well. So, you know, I, you learn a lot of skills doing this shit, you know, I had to do, uh, my own marketing. I had, for example, I had my friend, uh, Mauricio doing my marketing advisor where I'd pay him in sandwiches, for example. Um, so yeah, I mean, at the same time, you know, what I'm doing now is has to do a lot with what I did in, in back in school. I'm doing studying business management now. So, you know, it correlates a bit with what I did in high school a bit. And uh, yeah, so one of the main, I mean, to be honest with you, like I, I wasn't the best in school grade wise, I would say. But I, I mean, I improved better in my junior and um, senior year, but you know, before it wasn't the best. But, you know, I, 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 when I did my interview for this school that I'm at right now, um, one of the main things that I think personally got me into that is talking about doing these sandwiches. And, you know, everybody thinks, you know, when, when, I, when I talk to people normally and they're like, oh, what did you used to do in high school? I'm like, oh, I sold sandwiches. Their instant reaction for most, the majority of people is they laugh. But then... Once, and it's the same thing with the interviewers that I interviewed for, for, for my college. They, they started laughing. But, you know, once I, I started getting into how serious and dedicated I was to doing this, like, they start realizing, oh, so, you know, he, he, he was on his shit. He was doing marketing, uh, selling in person. And they, they take it more seriously once I explain it at the end of the day. But, yeah, it's kind of a joke. But at the end of the day, I, I did put a lot of time and effort doing that stuff. You know, what I meant by consistency wasn't like just, you know, oh, you were like one of the few people who was selling throughout the year, whereas other people came in and out. I mean, that, I think that is a fair point. Uh, you know, to the cheerleaders credit, I don't want to disrespect them. You know, they, 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 they sold fire brownies. You can't deny the heat they sold. Like it was only for two yeah. weeks or so, but it was heat. But what I meant was like, you know, the people who did sell, not only did they sell like short term, but I'm talking about like the people who like pre-packaged stuff. Like right. all they right. did was they just went to like a Costco or a BJ's just bought like a pack of Oreos or a pack of bars or whatever. And, you know, they just sold it. They sold it and that was it. They were really sloppy, really lazy. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All of them got caught for some reason. And, you know, all like, of them got caught. My yeah, question, um, to you, my question to yeah, you is like, how did you not get caught? Um, <laughs> well, I, I had to learn the, the where the security guards would be, you know, um, and at one point, for example, um, well, yeah, so I, I had to be a little bit, you know, a bit discreet in the hallways, especially when there was a security guard on each floor. But um, yeah, so I had to like, be a little bit cautious there. But most of the time I would do like, I would, I would text them before they would text me, for example. And we would link up uh, somewhere around the school. And um, so, yeah, I had to do that. And then at one point, uh, for the first year that I did it, um, at the end, um, school started uh, going under construction. And um, the old cafeteria was getting knocked down. So they pushed all where, where the CSI students were, were the people who don't know what CSI is, is uh, yeah, you work basically for the schools cleaning up. And um, they were stuck in, or they kept them in uh, the old cafeteria that was getting knocked down. So they moved them to the pavilion where I used to really thrive in and, and really sell a lot of my sandwiches at. And um, so at one point, yeah, I was doing really, really well. And um, it was at the end of the year where this uh, cafeteria was getting knocked down. And um, so I'm doing what I do normally. And um, everybody's crowding around me, you know, money in hand, phone in hand for cash app and all that stuff. So um, Doc, the, the security guard that watches over the CSI students, um, he comes over, he, not, he uh, taps me on the shoulder. And this guy's a big, big security guard, man. Like, he, you know, he holds his weight. So I turn around and I flinch. I'm like, oh shit, you know? I, I was a bit scared. I'm looking up at him. And he's like, come with me. And I'm like, oh fuck. 
So, um, but you know, the thing is, is that I was ready for it. You know what I mean? Like I, this situation played in my head a lot, a lot. Like I had to think exactly what I was going to say. You know, I was ready for it. You know, I, I knew the risk that was at hand. And so, yeah, so he pulls me aside and he's like, what, are you selling drugs? And I'm like, no, I'm selling sandwiches. And he starts laughing like everybody does, right? And I'm like, do you want one? I got Nutella, salami, prosciutto. Please have one, please. And he's like, no, 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 no. You have any money on you? And I'm like, I only got 10 bucks on me. You want them? He's like, no, you could keep them. Because most of the, the money that I used to make was uh, on, on the phone. So it's bank transfers through Venmo, Cash App. So that's where the majority of the stuff came through. And um, so I didn't have any money on me. So he's like, look, next time I see you ca um, selling sandwiches, you're, I'm gonna send you to uh, the principal's office or something like that. So I'm like, all right, cool. So for the next two weeks, I laid low, you know, I was just watching Doc, watching that one security guard, what he was doing in the day. You know, uh, when he was at the cafeteria where he would go and shit. And um, I started selling it in my backpack this time because I had a I had a big red bag that was really noticeable. And uh, so I resorted to selling it in my backpack. So, yeah, that I mean, I was really careful at the end of the day how I didn't get caught after that. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I was I was careful w with what I did. And, you know, I wasn't really just um, showing it a lot. Like, it looked like I had on, it on me. So, so yeah. Yeah. You know what I think it is, though? I, I, I think it's that, like the stuff that people are, like, typically caught selling with. Like, you know, it's like brownies, cookies, like all these sweet stuff. Like, that is typically associated with, like, drugs and, like, being, like, laced with drugs. But it's yeah, like yeah, no yeah. one is going to put marijuana in a sandwich. A sandwich. <laughs> so... You know, I think if you had been selling brownies or cookies, like you would have gone straight to the principal's office, no cap. But because you know it's a sandwich, it's good. People, yeah. people just like, oh, that's pretty cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's different as well. Like you don't see it every day. Someone selling sandwiches at school. So, yeah, I mean, I that's what set me apart really from the rest. And um, yeah, yeah, it set me apart a little bit. Yeah, because like all like a bunch of teachers knew. Well. I want to say a bunch. The only ones that I knew, knew, were um, your physics teacher. What's his name, Mr. Um, Mr. Del Valle. Mr. Del Valle. Yeah, he knew because I I came um, in that class one time, and and one of my friends told me to to come in. And he said he was a very chill teacher, and he'll let you sell. So I went in there and I started selling. And he's like, what are you selling? What are you selling? And I'm like, oh, sandwiches. You want one? And he's like, yeah, I'll have one. And I'm like, how much? And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's for free. For you, it's for free. Because I knew that if I uh, got to know the teachers or kind of, you know, give them something in return. Uh, I mean, some people could see that as bribery, obviously. I get that, that, that uh, viewpoint of it. But, you know, I... I I'm being nice. I'm being nice. I'm using this class. I'm interrupting the class. Like I'll give you a sandwich free of charge, whatever. And uh, from then on now, I kept on going every, every day, basically to that class because I knew people would, would uh, let me, I mean, he would let me uh, sell in there and people would buy it. But him and um, Miss, um, oh, I keep on forgetting these names. Uh, she was a, a business teacher. Miss Brown. The one right, Miss Lopez. Miss Lopez. She knew because she let me use her uh, her toaster oven every single day during lunch um, in the in the break room. So so yeah. So those are the only two that I know of. I mean, I don't know. Do you, Miss Zuniga? She never really clocked it, even though I literally did it right in front of her. I don't know. Um, but do you know if any other teachers knew about it other than them two? I think Mr. Molina knew. Yeah, I think at the end he did because I mean I had him for two years during the two years that I did it. Uh, those are the two years that I had him, and um, yeah, I think he clocked it once. I got a logo, so I got a logo for my sandwiches to set myself even more apart, you know, aesthetically and all that, and. Um, 
So yeah, I think I, because I put it on the desk. I so I put bro, I put those stickers everywhere, man. I made about a thousand stickers and I was putting them all over the fucking school. Brand there, brand there. You know, every single toilet I got one in there. Um, so he's like, yeah, what's that? Because he, he knows my last name by now, you know, two years with me. So he's like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, that's my logo. For what? And I'm like, oh, it's just, just a logo that I made for myself. So, I mean, I don't know if you got, you know, the, the sense of things there. But, um, yeah. Yeah, other than that, I was pretty, pretty low-key about it. I liked, I liked his class, to be fair. That, it was a science class for anyone who doesn't know who that is. It's a science class. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of conspiracy talk about um, the phone listening to you and showing ads and stuff. And for those of you who haven't watched the um, Social Dilemma, I mean, have you watched it, Kobus? Have you watched? I this? have not. No. Oh man, I really for anyone who hasn't watched it yet, I really suggest you do. Uh, from then, I've deleted my Instagram, took off all my notifications on my phone. I was thinking about Snapchat, but Snapchat is just, uh, I mean, the last platform I have, but I took notifications off there. It's just a really big eye opener, like really, really big. Isn't and it just it ties back into what we were talking about in that class, where mm -hmm. it was listening to you and shows you exactly what you want to see, exactly what you want to see. All the adverts are like, um, they're, they're made literally for you, for your, your interest, as well, political views. There's another really good one about um, this company. It's called Gray Matter. Uh, no, Gray Effect. Uh, no, no, I, I think I know which one you're talking about. Uh, Cambridge, the one who Cambridge collects Analytica. It. Yeah. Exactly, exactly that. Where, uh, have you seen that one? Uh, I haven't seen that specific documentary, but I know the situation. Basically, what would happen is this company was able to col collect millions of users because if you agreed to you know give them your data it would also collect the data of all your friends whether or not they agreed to it yeah exactly so and to, to add on to that they would uh categorize you into uh different uh different slots basically uh democrat uh undecided and republican so what they would do for these undecided category of these su su a list of people from facebook and they would uh, show you different political views and they would actually do uh, more Republican views and to make them go vote for Trump. So what they would do for these undecided people is show them a ton of uh, Republican views and, and it basically influenced them to, to vote for Trump at the end of the day. And that's, I mean, I, I, I don't know, man, the, a lot of conspiracy. It's the only election where you really hear like conspiracy about, you know, the, the Russians getting involved into it, you know, this, this company getting involved, influencing people. I don't know. I've never heard, I mean, about election like that has been so, uh, so control, I mean, not control, but so covered by the media. You know what I mean? I mean, I, mean, I, I do, don't know. I, I do agree. think that these last few elections, the role of social media companies has been greater in the sense that the information you receive from social media is more likely to influence your vote way more than, you know, listening to CNN or Fox News or MSNBC. Yeah. And because of that reason, other countries have been able to, what do you call it? take advantage of that to push the election in their direction. And this goes both ways. So there are multiple countries doing election interference for both Trump and Biden. Uh, but yeah, our social media has just taken over such a big part of our lives that once you infiltrate it and push whatever narrative you want, there was something that Mark Twain said, which really struck a chord with me. It's like, a lie will travel the world before the truth has tied its shoes. So wow, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. The, per the perfect example is remember that story where it said, oh, Harambe got 13,000, 10,000 votes. That yeah. was fake news. Yeah. That was that fake was news. Fake. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of that going around. Fake news is another thing that's really corrupting people's head and, and, and really influencing once again to, to, to think a certain way about you know different political views or different things in general so yeah it's it's really fucked this world man like I, like the business model around it right is is you know instead of 
company selling a product to you, yeah? Your phone is, or, 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 or um, you know. You are the product. So, yeah, you are the product being, exactly. You're being sold to the, uh, to the um, advertising companies. It's, it's, it's really crazy, man. It, this world is, is progressing too fast. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's something else. The yeah. social dilemma sounds like a good do- documentary. I'll check it out. Uh, but honestly, I didn't like. I didn't need to watch a documentary to know that they were yeah. fucking listening to my conversations. Because no cap, like I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone listening to to you. But like, you talk about a product like ice cream or shoes and then an advertisement for that product will appear five minutes later the most recent one that happened to me was i was in the car with my brother my sister and my brother's friend and we were like we were all hungry we were like yo what are we gonna eat and like we were saying one of the places we suggested was burger king so little did i know when i opened my phone an advertisement for burger king popped up a coupon and like we ended up going to Burger King because like if these companies care enough to listen to me, then we got to take advantage of their deals. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, it's just creepy as fuck that these people are listening to me and all of us by extension and giving us recommendations. I haven't had an experience like that before, but I, I've heard a lot of people say the same thing where they've talked about it. And then two seconds later, they get something, uh, an advertisement on Instagram, Facebook, whatever of exactly that thing. So, I mean, yeah, man, it's, it's a, it's a really weird world we're living in now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so you're in the UK right now, right? I am. Yep. In the UK, exactly. In a small room like you, man, uh, probably smaller than yours, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah. Uh, what in university are you going to in the UK? Uh, I'm going to a French school, uh, a French business school called ESCP. Europe and basically um, it's one of the oldest European business schools in the world Um, and it has a special program or it's basically the whole school does it but um, for their bachelor's degree um, instead of doing four years like you would in the US you're doing three years so it saves me a year as well and basically you um, you go to three different campuses around Europe for uh, a different campus each year. So this year I'm starting out in London. Next year I'm going to Turin in uh, the north of Italy, and then third year I'm going to Paris. Yeah, so I got my hands full for the next three years. Yeah. All right. Um, and you know, why did you choose that school specifically? Um. I chose it because, um, well, basically I didn't really get accepted to any place that I wanted to go. And I, from the beginning, I never really wanted to, to stay in the U.S. Uh, one, because of money, you know, uh, once you go out of state, you're, you're paying a fortune, student debt for the rest of your life, basically. And I mean, I know that's an exaggeration, but like still, it's, it's a lot of money at the end of the day. And, uh, I've always had my eyes sight on um, on Europe, really, and um, I have family here, so I'm staying with my father's side of the family, um, staying with them, and um, yeah, I chose this school because I had a mutual friend that also went here. Uh, I said it was a really good school, and I and I looked it up um, online, and it says that it's actually the top uh, three business school in uh in france so i I mean i saw that as a really uh you know go for it you know and i i applied to a couple schools in america you know uh fiu fsu um but yeah i I really didn't really want to stay here i mean stay uh sorry in uh in florida i grew up there 18 years i said it was enough and i want to experience some seasons at the same time I'm, i'm tired of being hot man so I agree. I'm here getting cold for once. Yeah. Wait, so is it cheaper for like you or just people in general to like go out of country than it is out of state in America? Um, so 
All right, can you say that again? So, okay, you, you, you mentioned how the, co like, how the cost yeah. of, um, you know, living, like, yeah. not living, but, like, going to school outside of the state of Florida is a lot, and, you know, how you'd be put in debt. Um, there's, it's a very true point. And then, you know, my question was, you know, is it cheaper for a person to, like, go out of country than it would be for them to go out of Florida? Um, so one thing I have to say that helped me a lot is being European, first of all. So since I do have a, a French passport, that gave me a, a discount uh, towards my school. So, I mean, it could be uh, cheaper. I mean, it depends, obviously, what your options are, you know. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it really depends. It really depends on on what school you're comparing it to, but it is a very good option for, I mean, if you're really trying to, 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 to really leave the country, definitely that's a place to go. And um, it's fairly, it's, it's a reasonable price. You know what I mean? Like compared to, I have, I have a friend that's going to uh, an Ivy League school and, and he still has a, a scholarship with, with the school and he's still paying 60 grand a year. That's, you know, that's crazy money. Man. That's 200 and what? 240,000 in four years. Am I right? Uh, yeah. 240,000. Yeah. Right. So that, you know, that's ridiculous money, man. I'm not even paying that. I'm not even paying that. You know what I mean? I'm only doing three years as well. So, you know, it depends what your options are, obviously. So if you have like, for example, an Ivy League school compared to, for example, where I'm going, I mean, it depends what you want. It depends money, it really, yeah. It just depends on your options, really. Yeah. All right. Now, I wanna get to the fact that, once again, specifically, you live in uh, the UK, right? And um, for those of you who don't know the difference between, one of the differences between the UK and the US um, is that, in the US, uh, we have private health insurance companies and you have to pay out of your own pocket for health insurance. But in the UK, they have a national healthcare system where it's government funded healthcare, um, you know, for everyone. Uh, my question to you, John Luca, is, um, so how does the health insurance work? Do you use the UK health insurance or do you have to work with the American insurance companies? Wait, uh, can you get closer to the mic? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I've always actually had a uh, European uh, health insurance when I was living in the US. But I mean, for people who live in the UK, there's the NHS, the National Health um, Society. I mean, I'm not really sure what the abbreviation stands for. But anyways, it's the government. Yeah, as you said, the government uh, provides health insurance. But um, I have a, a, a private health insurance where, I mean, I don't know really how that works. It's just my parents, I'm not too sure about that. But um, yeah, the health, the, the insurance system in the, U, the US and the UK are very different from each other. And uh, yeah, you stated it already that uh, yeah, the government um, aids you here in the UK and then you pay out of pocket in the, in the US, so yeah. Um all right, what's the most fun thing to do in the UK? You know, I know you're there to, you know, grind for your business major, uh, but you know, once school is over, are you, like, you, you can't just like sit around at your house doing nothing forever. So like, you yeah. know, what what is there to do that's fun in the COVID world, UK wise? Okay, so for one, the UK I feel like is much more strict than the US. Um, there are still, you know, I've heard in, in FSU in Tallahassee that COVID is not even a thing anymore, basically. And there's a uh, hundred percent capacity in, in these clubs and bars. So, uh, I mean, I'm very limited um, in the things that I do because I'm also living with my family here. Um, and I don't want to bring it back to them. You know, a whole story goes with that. Um, but the funnest thing I, I would say is really just visiting the city and, and just exploring, really. Um, yeah, so exploring, it's a big city. So there's a lot of things to do, a lot of things to explore. Um, and in the COVID world, it's not that limited. You know, you could, you 
could go explore, you could go find new places. And, um, well, for me at least, I enjoy the, the pub culture that's in the UK because, you know, you don't really find that in the US. People just going after work, oh, let's just go to the pub and have some drinks. And uh, that's one of, the, uh, one of the big things that I've enjoyed, you know, going after school with uh, friends from school. And yeah, there's just different types of cultures um, that are very different to, to what I'm used to in Miami. Wait, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I want to ask you another question, but um, I'm going to address something you said earlier. It's not that COVID isn't a thing anymore. It's that people specifically in Tallahassee and just in general in Florida act like it's not a thing. So it's still a very right. serious problem, but people pretend like it doesn't exist. And, you yeah. know, I've heard that there's a, like a stricter culture um, in the U in Europe in general, because they were so hardly hit by the virus early on that it just sort of shocked everyone. And now you, you go anywhere and most people are wearing masks, right? I wear it uh, almost 24 hours a day, you know, going in, in the, the metro or the tube, the underground. Um, everybody's wearing masks, you know, you're sitting uh, one seat apart from each other. Same thing in the buses, like, I mean, for me, at least, I live really far away from school. It takes me about an hour to get there. I have to take bus in the morning, uh, and then train for another 45 minutes, and then walk to school. So, I mean, yeah, I've seen the, the daily, the daily uh, commute, you know, that everybody goes through, and everybody's wearing a mask. They're really enforcing it now, and there's fines behind it, you know, um, but yeah, more and more they're starting to enforce it. But I've heard that there is um, in in FSU that basically everybody's got it, so there isn't any COVID cases anymore, and there's only like 23 in a week. I mean, is that is that correct? You know, our governor didn't really do a good job of uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic. But you know, herd immunity cannot happen unless most of the population gets COVID, and most of the population, you know, even though our numbers are a lot. Most of the population in Florida has not gotten COVID. Uh, they're dealing with it uh, completely differently. So, you know, I, I remember there was those stages where going back into normality, this is uh, what we're dealing with in Europe is um, stages of how bad it gets. So they put um, tiers, we have tiers in the UK at least. And uh, London right now is in tier two. So um your mandatory face masks um there's a, a 10 p.m closing rule for all pubs and and restaurants and um yeah so then there's tier three that the north of uh, the uk has gone under where it's basically uh, a lot of businesses closed down again but the thing is i really don't know if the government can really afford another lockdown because they've already pumped in so much money, uh, you know, after the lockdown about, uh, I don't even know the exact number, but it's billions of dollars. I mean, um, sorry, pounds. And um, I don't know if they could afford it, to be honest with you. I, I really uh, don't. Well, look, um, there is going to be a second wave, you know, whether or not we like that. And it's not just going to affect the UK and one particular country, no. We are going to see a general uptick of COVID cases in the second wave from now till the end of the year, because you know what happens now? Winter is coming, baby. Is coming, yeah. And <laughs> that makes the virus yeah. have a breeding, breeding ground, makes it more susceptible that people get it and that they die. Yeah. And, you know, there's a moral argument to be had whether or not lockdowns are necessary, you know, but... It, it, if everyone wore a mask, things would be better. But if you are going to do a shutdown, then you better make sure that you have aid for the businesses who are going to suffer economically from that. And the people who work in those businesses, for those businesses, they have aid too. And what I've noticed is that the UK's response is significantly better. And not just the UK, but all the European countries, their responses are significantly better than the U.S.'s. Yeah. Yeah, well, can you come closer? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so yeah i mean you're you're right i think the same exact thing that the i mean once again the uk and most of europe was hit differently at different times uh by the virus and you know different leaders call for different reactions and um i think that yeah they've done a good job but so sometimes I still see people in the in the public transportation without any mask or anything like that. So, um, you know, yeah, once again, different leaders, different ways of dealing with the situation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and like with the U.S., it's sort of been left to a state by state and a city by city cases, which is why, you know, state and local elections matter just as much, if not more than the federal elections. Because if you look at how different states like there's stark contrasts between how each different state handled this and i'm not trying to make a what do you call it a partisan point because i think there are democrats who have done a bad job of covid at least initially and i think there are republican governors who did a good job of containing this virus one of those examples is the vermont vermont's governor phil scott and massachusetts governor scott brown uh, but what I'm saying is that each individual state, like uh, these elections matter because you, who do you want in charge of the next crisis? Somebody who's going to completely uh, blow it off or somebody who's going to do their best to handle it. And, you know, I understand the need to protect small businesses and make sure they can survive and thrive, but we, we can't have a good economy until we control the virus because if the virus is not controlled exactly. if the virus is not controlled then no one's going to want to go out the economy cannot work until this virus is controlled yeah the virus controls the economy the economy basically you know when it goes up the you know economy goes down and vice versa um yeah no i agree with you totally yeah yeah you can't um thrive during a, a pandemic it's 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 really hard and um a lot of people have gone out in business in the u.s and in the uk you know it's not just uh one place that has been affected ev uh, negatively it's basically everywhere and uh for example i've had a um like a vacation week this week and you know i, I wanted to go and visit uh, other places in europe you know, because it's it's pretty cheap to to get a train or a bus to you know uh, I could go to Paris for example for about forty bucks, um, Amsterdam get a flight they're really cheap, and they've had this uh, list going on, uh, you know where you you can't go there without doing a, a fourteen day quarantine and when you come back you have to do another one. Um, so yeah, it's it's very frustrating, but at the same time, you know, you got to do with what you have and you got to make the best of what um, what's in front of you, you know. Uh, once an opportunity is there, you take it and it forces you even more now to, to make even more of an effort to, to really, you know, cherish what you have, you know. It, it kind of reflects, it makes you think about how you know, grateful for the things that you have and, you know, don't really let it, you know, limit what you can do, you know, don't make it an excuse to what, oh, I can't do this because of COVID. Yeah, you can. I mean, obviously you have to go through the special parameters or whatever, but, you know, I've learned to, you know, deal with what, what the situation is and make the most of it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, you mentioned traveling, uh, you know, to different parts of Europe. So, like, what I've experienced and what I've heard is that, you know, there's this thing called the European Union, which all the European countries get together. Now, I know the UK left, like, four years ago, and I don't know how their situation is working. But besides the UK, like, all these European countries get together, and they work together on the economy, and they all share this one currency. So, um, you know, like, my question is, um, you know, like, is, is it really that easy to travel across, like, different states? It's just kind of like going from one state to another, right? Uh, well, 
within can you come closer? EU, yeah, within the EU, um, there's no really borders. You know, you could go from Spain to to France driving, and you won't get stopped or anything. You just see a a sign going by saying you're now in France or you know Italy or whatever. Um, so within the EU, yeah, it's 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 different now because uh, Brexit and all that. Uh, the UK, you have to go through immigration, you know, and as well, it's an island. So, you, you know, you have to um, either go by, uh, you can actually, yeah, you could go by bus, train or, or flight. So, um, yeah, I think there is a, an immigration process that you have to go through. But, you know, other than that, it's not really hard to get around. Um, obviously, now, since certain excuse me, um, these um, special, special parameters concerning the, the quarantine and all that. Um, it, yeah, it's become a lot harder and you're restricted to, well, for me at least, uh, I just stayed in the UK and visited what's around me. So, so yeah. You're on mute. Yeah, I mean, oh, my bad. Um, I right. just want to prevent background noise. Uh, anyway, ha, huh, um, did you watch the debate between Trump and Biden? Uh, I watched highlights of the first one, uh, the second one as well. Um, really didn't take much from the second one, but the first one was just a, a laughing stock, man, especially here. You know, everybody's just saying what an idiot this guy is. And at the same time, I'm there. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I don't know. It's viewing it from 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 the the EU, from the UK. It's just a lot. You you get exposed to different, um, you know, different perceptions as well. Uh, paradigms. You know what I mean? So like people are across the pond. So they have different views and different things to say about it. Would that are a lot different from what you would hear in the in the in the u.s but i mean uh, the general the thing that i got from it is um that trump is just really hard to work with you know what i mean um they now i did you notice in the second one now they have once you have your two minutes to to speak they mute the they mute out yeah they, they mute out the other person and the only reason they're doing that is because of trump and uh yeah man i i just thought it was a joke like, well, honestly, yeah. Sorry. Go. Oh, well, I mean, look, the reason why I think, you know, the, the the second debate, this one went so much smoother was I don't even think you really needed the mute button because, like, the only time, like, I only saw it used once, maybe twice, you know, but the candidates sort of self regulated themselves. But, you oh, know, yeah. I, I, I think both of them sort of took in the criticism the constructive criticism about their debate performance and both of them adjusted accordingly and there was like no interruptions i had such low expectations for this debate and you know i don't know if it makes me a bad person for wanting a shit show because it gives me a lot to talk about for small room but you know for the sake of democracy i'm glad this debate went somewhat smoothly um and my question is you know how did like like, how does the international community, specifically the UK, perceive, you know, America, like, watching such a shit show? Um, well, um, you know, there's two sides of, 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 um, of the perceptions, you know what I mean? So there's the person who, you know, there's a, a, a lot of, for one of the main reasons, yeah, that they did this Brexit is to have more control about the immigrants that come in. And there's a very huge party called the EDL, who uh, are basically your equivalent of uh, white supremacists, kind of. It's, it's the same type of, you know, uh, ideologies and that. And as well, there's other people that just think that come, Trump is a complete joke like complete another joke. Like I, my uncle absolutely hates the guy. And you know, he, that's more often than not what I would, I would see is that it's just a, a joke. This guy is a joke, you know, like I, he, they just see the guy, you know, the wonky hair and all that. And fair enough, 
you know, so this is the first time, first time I've ever seen, I've, uh, in a shop where you would see a little, uh, uh, um, stuffed Donald Trump with his, you know, one of those wacky hairs that you can mess around with. First time I've ever seen that in my life. You know, you don't see like a stuffed animal or stuffed uh, Barack Obama or a bush or anything like that, you know? And they put it next to their prime minister. Um, um, what's Boris Johnson. Uh, Boris Johnson. Exactly. With his wacky hair as well. They kind of remind me of the same person. So, so yeah. First time I've ever seen that. Yeah, and there's a lot of people saying, and you know, from what I've seen of his politics, I would agree with the statement that Boris Johnson is uh, basically the UK's equivalent of um, Trump. Yeah, he is. Yeah, that is your uh, UK equivalent of Donald Trump. That's why in that shop that I saw, um, they two stuffed animals of Boris Johnson next to Trump with big wacky hair, same color. Um, and yeah, so there's your equivalent. Here's, yeah. here's a photo. He looks more like the similarities between him and Trump are, for the most part, uncanny. You know, I think the only thing that's missing is the orange spray tan. Uh, right. Anyway, like exactly. my question is, how, like, how does, okay, since the UK and the US, you know, are very different countries, like, how do you think that these leaders who are so similar, like, rise and come to power? One could say um, that people have had enough of the same type of uh, passive leaders that don't really do, you know, they don't have that much of a impact. You know what I mean? So you, there's, you know, in the U S there's presidents that don't even come up in history. You know, they just fly on by, you know? Um, and I guess the, the, the people who really stand out kind of are more susceptible to, to be attractive to, 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 to people and people want change nowadays. That's, that's, that's what people are going after. And I mean, I could see, you know, the two, the, the two perceptions of the two sides. And I, I mean, I would agree with, with what they're saying, you know, change is, is good. And I agree with that. You know, I, I, I guess you could say that both parties have that same type of ideology. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not really that um, knowledgeable in that sense, but yeah. Would you agree with that? I mean, I mean, like, I don't think change is necessarily a good thing if the change is in the wrong direction. And I think with Trump. Right. And no, Boris, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 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 But that's how people perceive it is what I'm gathering. You're saying, and I would agree with you there that that's how people perceive it. You know, they right. are sick of these standard establishment politicians. And when they get something that's different from that, that's uh, very appealing to them. What I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Um, what do you want to be known for? I mean, I don't, I don't know if I want to be known for anything, honestly. Um, I, you know, probably just work in the shadows and unless I'm happy doing what I'm doing, you know, like, I, for example, I, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to be a servant to money. You know what I mean? I'm going to make money my servant in a way. And, you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to, you know, money's good at the end of the day, but what I'm pursuing right now, I, I mean, I don't know what I really want to do, uh, you know, as a career. So um, that's why I'm studying business management because it's a more of a broad study of, of, of the sector. And what my plan is, is to really try the different, uh, the different sectors, yeah, of, of business. So finance, working in a bank, you know, um, stock market, you know, the list goes on. So I just want to dip my feet in different pools, if you know what I mean. Yes. Right. So, yeah. So I don't know if I want to be known for something, you know, maybe fame comes, I don't know. Were you saying like famous or known for something? I, I guess both. I mean, fame comes with a lot of res different responsibilities. And I don't know if I would be up for it, you know, but if I, if I'm doing what I want to do and I make a good living out of it, I'll be happy, you know? So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, you've been a wonderful guest for episode 19 of small room. Uh, but as you know, all great things must end. Um, it's been an honor having you on. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure being here. 
big fan and um, I'm happy being here. Nice having a little chat with you, man. Uh, you too. Uh, stay safe. For those of you who are new to Small Room Report, if you found this interview entertaining or informative, please give me a follow on the platform you use to listen. All the platforms of my guest or guests is in the description. Have a great day.